The theme of this discussion is networked India, are we there yet? So my first question, Shrikant Sinha, is for you. What is the there that we're trying to get to? I think that's a very relevant question that we need to ask. For me, there means a lady in a rural part in India using a mobile app to train her kids, uh, you know, going to school. I think that's the there over there. A farmer or a fisherman looking at an app through a mobile trying to find out what uh, fertilizers he should use or what crops he should grow, whether he should go today to fish or not. That's the there. Sachin Bhatia with 930 million mobile connections in India and a population of 1.2 billion. We're almost there, or are we? I would look at it differently, really. You know, uh, I think the human race is, uh, uh, it, it, I think, strives on inequality. I don't think we'll ever get there. You know, but is that even important? Is that an important question? As long as it can make a meaningful impact to a bunch of people, I think we are there. So if, like he said, uh, if there's a farmer and uh, you know, he has a mobile phone and because he can get access to price of uh, seeds or he can get access to at what price he should sell his product in the, in the market and that affects, say, 10 members of his family, I think we are there. So I don't think everyone needs to have access to this and it'll never happen. But as long as increasingly more people get access to technology and benefit from it, I think we are there. Let's talk about the mobile phone as a tool for inclusion. Rikin Gandhi, in a recent UN report on the Millennium Development Goals, the report said, and this is disturbing, that India has more cell phones than toilets. So poor people who, are, who have the choice between building a toilet or accessing a toilet and buying a cell phone are buying cell phones. What's wrong with this picture? I think it's a real issue because sometimes we think about development only in pure technological dimensions. And sometimes the social ones are even more important. And I would say with regard to your first question and even the second one, it's important to think about networked India is that we already have actually a pretty good social network in the country. As people often say is that there's six degrees of separation between yourself and perhaps the prime minister. And th that sort of di social distance is reducing. Uh, and I think that's creating the possibility for real change. However, there's a need to really empower people through this network so that it's not just that people are consumers of sort of information or of uh, benefits, whether they be toilets or uh, mobile phones, but that they're actually people who create these things for themselves and for their communities. Nishant Batra, I'm going to read a sentence that would have made no sense in the year 2000. 15 years ago, this sentence, this sentence would have made very little sense, but today it seems natural. Today morning, I used my GPS to book a Uber, Uber cab. I used my Dropbox account to save my boarding card. I flashed my mobile phone with a QR code uh, at the airport. I uh, found my driver using WhatsApp, and I updated my Facebook and Twitter page on my way here. This sentence would have made no sense 15, 20 years ago. And yet, this is the sentence we all take for granted today. But only 13% of us, only 13% of all cell phone users have a 3G connection that can use any of this. Are we pricing millions and millions of people out of technology? Uh, I think the price sensitivity is, uh, is dual fold. Uh, one is you need the service at the right price for somebody to actually go and subscribe. But more importantly, what we notice is the cost of the device itself. And that is usually the gating factor. Uh, there is a reason for, 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 for a telecom operator in India or for a telecom vendor like Ericsson, we don't differentiate in terms of the pricing 2G, 3G, 4G that much. The cost of deploying, the cost of installation is not that different. What is different is the cost of the device that is in the user's hands. And in the case of 3G, we still see the price elasticity for the Indian consumer, I'm talking not 70 million, 100 million, I'm talking 500 million Indian consumers to pick up that device, to make the social impact that we heard of today, the device price needs to come down. And we've seen that it's on that journey already. By 2020, we envision that almost half of India will have a 3G device in their hand. And almost a quarter of India will have a 4G, 4G device in their hand. And it's because the device price needs to come down. And it that's, will. That, that's the key factor, the device price is the key factor. Shrikant Sinha, back to you. We keep talking about sustainability as one of the big pillars when it comes to uh, technology and how technology can impact society. Give us a sense of what does sustainability mean when it comes to technology? Are we talking about only e-waste here? Or are we talking about a larger concept in sustainability? 
if, if we talk about uh, e-waste per se, if you look at in, and if we today put our hands in our drawers, I'm sure we'll come across a couple of mouse or lying over there, some old mobile phones over there. And India today is the fifth largest producer of e-waste in the world. And e-waste is a challenge. It is a reality that is facing in us, us in our face. And uh, we need to ensure that not only do we reduce e-waste, we should try to adopt programs where we can probably extend the end of life of systems, probably you know, refurbish computers. Majority of our corporate customers would use a computer for three years and then probably discard it. In case we can reutilize it, repurpose it, refurbish it, and give it to the NGOs and probably some of the people who, are, who don't have these kinds of, of, or ready to pay a very steep price for these computers, they can be used over there. Second thing, it's very important to educate people how to dispose the e-waste. If we had some kind of a, a mechanism where an e-waste bin could be provided in most of the places where people, when they put an old mobile phone, would give them some internet free, probably it could be the way out. Rikin Gandhi, in the 1980s, when I went to college, we talked about a concept called the paperless office. This is when I encountered my first computer. And we said, by the year 2000, offices will be paperless. It's going to be green. We're going to use electronic communications. And the world is going to be a happy, shiny place with lots of trees. It's the year 2015. We use, I think, 10 times the amount of paper that we did before computers were invented. And we dump our computers every two years because the processes get faster. The battery technology gets better. Where is this all going to end? Where are we truly going to see technology enabling a greener existence? Whether we're talking about moving to a paperless office or throwing our garbage into the waste bin, those things require social capital investment, almost separate but equally important to the investment that we're making, say, in technological infrastructure. Sachin Bhatia, once upon a time we spoke about the haves and the have-nots, those who had access to money and education and those who didn't. Today we talk about the digital haves and the digital have-nots, or the digital natives and the digital illiterates. Technology in itself can, can, can pose some pretty high barriers to entry. How do you think the citizens of India can overcome this, this kind, this barrier? And what can companies like yours and the others do to help them overcome this? It's a tough one, honestly, but like he mentioned, I think it's the entry cost of the enabling technology, right? It's the entry cost of devices. That's the kind of cost that has to come down. The cost of, you know, the mobile phones or the tablets or the PCs, those are, those are things which have to come down. And then they'll permeate down to, you know, every and anyone. What about there. issues of digital literacy, for instance? How to use a touch, touch screen phone? How to use an app? How yeah. to use a payment gateway? I, I think those are easy to solve. I've gone into villages. I, I, I trek a lot. I've gone into villages and I've shown kids kids my, my phone. Of course, it doesn't have connectivity they take to there. It naturally? But they take to it naturally. It's, it's, a, it's a human condition, right? And now I think all app developers uh, you know, are developing apps which don't necessarily require language skills. You know, on apps like ours, it's, it's very, very visual. So if anything is visual, people adapt to it very, very quickly. So I don't see that as an issue, really. Nishant Batra, your engagement with governments and e-governance, for instance, what kind of demand are you seeing there, especially from the Indian government? So let me, let me start from a global context first, and I'll bring it down to India. From a global context, uh, what we do is the concept of smart cities. Now we call it smart sustainable cities around the topics we just discussed. So Ericsson has been the enabling connectivity platform for a lot of these smart cities, smart sustainable cities around the world. Now in India, we see a big thrust. Uh, the Honorable Minister brought it up as well. Uh, the government's behind it, Digital India, three pillars, e-governance, uh, the smart cities. I think we need to get behind it. As a, as a, what I would like to call us as a producer of innovation in this field, we would like to make sure that when these smart cities come around, they are sustainable, they are affordable, and they are pervasive. And that's where we come. Shikhan Sina, back to you. I'm going to stay on the topic of e-governance. Now, we see e-governance in pockets. For instance, the Passport Seva Kendra is now a real delight to go and if any of you have experienced the Passport Seva Kendra, the land records in states like Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka is, is a real pleasure to navigate. For those of you who've been to Gujarat and seen the Gujarat, it's called the G-SWAN, the Gujarat State Wide Area Network. It's a fantastic resource for farmers and people living in remote areas in Gujarat. 
and yet these are these examples are few and far between why is the indian government not adopting technology at a rate that's perhaps 5 or 10 times the speed at which it is doing so now uh, probably before i move to that i think i will also like to touch upon the digital literacy part of it and uh, because nascom foundation is also the industry partner for the government of india for digital literacy and probably how i would like to sum up the entire thing that we have discussed earlier on is with an example which has happened at one of our digital literacy center in pune where this lady is there who's a fourth class dropout she sells bhelpuri on a thela and the first thing she did after completing this program was using mobile technology set up a whatsapp group of all her customers and what she was discussing with us was that we have all these people every day the same person will not like to have bhelpuri every day and there are all these vendors who stand next to me how can i create an aggregator service just imagine the kind of innovation and the things that they were looking at if i come back to your question right now is government doing enough i think in 2006 when we started with the national e governance program etc the services were not being offered vles were set up a whole lot of infrastructure was created but at that time there were no services today it's happening it's happening a lot of uh, in fact if you look at what nascom is doing we have as part of our social innovation forum uh, or for mobile for good in both categories for social good we look at government also and how they are reaching out to uh, the consumers i think a lot is happening but yes it's tip of the iceberg lot more needs to be done over there sachin bachia for any want to be entrepreneurs in this audience do you have any ideas for public private partnerships between private players like yourself and the government using e governance what do you think are the top solutions that people should be looking at i think it's it's fairly basic and simple stuff which is needed so i was actually at the passport kendra uh, you know couple of weeks back and last week i went so and it was a very smooth process it works beautifully and it is a private public partnership because one part of the process is, is taken care of yeah by tcs and they obviously very very efficient but a telling example there is that as soon as it was lunch the tcs guys kept working in rotation but the government guys went away for lunch and then there was a huge queue well technology can't solve every problem. everything so right but the passport office is a center of excellence our delhi metro is a center of excellence those center of excellences need to now permeate down they need you know we 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 are a billion uh, people strong country uh, we are the seventh largest nation in the world we need to have millions of such centers of excellence and i think that is what is needed so i think everywhere you know all these places there is an opportunity for a public private partnership and very simple stuff the e seva thing the passport thing is is very very simple is very basic anyone can i think set that up so we need to do that across now rekin gandhi same question to you except I'm not going to ask you about commercial ideas what social opportunities is the network throwing up I think well the I think the government has organized uh, lots of different types of social organizations across the country whether we talk about women self help groups that have been organized for various types of government programs or other types of farmer or associations or other types of uh, organizations that exist across the country and these platforms which are mostly social in nature now can be ripe for connecting with network technology to actually be able to provide a variety of new services whether it's access to government schemes or services or access to perhaps even commercial sort of uh, providers of of inputs or markets that these agrarian communities for instance are so uh, often disconnected from but the fact that they already have this social infrastructure within them makes it a great platform to layer in technology it seems ironic that things like being able to find lost children or being able to help disabled people or being able to give everybody a vaccine every child a vaccine should fall under the purview of commercial viability do you think there's a, there are a bunch of let's say human endeavor or human uh, changes that we'd like to make to society that must be excluded from commercial viability uh yeah i think there are certain certain sorts of uh communities and certain types of services that should be considered as public goods and that deserve to be provided as public goods but those can those can still connect to commercial sorts of activities but the provision of these services and should be and should that therefore be excluded from the purview of private entrepreneurship not 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 excluded from the purview of of private entrepreneurship i would say that it's it's very important to maintain like an open access platform whether we're talking in social or technology in nature that you might be investing in in creating a, a public good like say organizing a women self help group now that might be a public good that you've kind of connected these women together and you've connected them with banks but then you can also say that maybe a private entrepreneur can come up with a way to aggregate say their produce of 
maybe some tribal art products and put them okay. online okay. Or, or provide access to inputs that they might use to produce. Okay. All right, we are nearing the end of this discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm nearing my last couple of questions. I'm going to start with the extreme left, Nishan Batra. We talked about the, the falling cost of the mobile handset itself. Let's assume we're doing this discussion 15 years from today. Would the mobile phone still be a physical device or would it be a network device? So even today, if you look at the smartphone as we call it, there's a device embedded inside it, it's called the SIM card. It's become software based. It's disappearing inside. Now we're talking- But literally as well. Yeah. We, we went from regular to micro to nano to, I don't yeah, know, atomic so next. Now we're talking software SIMs, right? And uh, now if you take a level further, not just from a SIM or a technology perspective, but, but, but from, a, from a user perspective, smartphones, look, the first thing when, when a phone rings, let's say the phone rings on the, on, the, on the stage here, all five of us will reach into our pocket, look if it's ours, now, fast forward one year, it's quite possible all four, five of us will look like this on a smartwatch. Okay. That's the difference, right? Because the smartphone's evolving. Now, when we're home and a certain beep comes, it may be the smart fridge in my kitchen. It might be the smart toaster there. Now we're talking about connected devices. And the, the first question that you asked, 930 million, are we getting there? What, what do we dare? We dare not to stop at the 1.4 billion population in India in 2020. We dare, dare to talk about much more than that because machines starts getting connected. That's where it comes to. If you've seen the movie Terminator, there's a, yes. there's a service called Skynet which one day becomes self-aware. Hmm. Do you think we are anywhere close to a network that is self-aware? Uh, I don't think so, not so in no? the near future. So no fears? No fears, no fears. Not, not, as no, not in our lifetime. Shikhan Sena, same question to you. We keep hearing about this magical phenomenon called the Internet of Things. Can you tell us what the Internet of Things is or the thing to net? I, I, I think uh, if you look at it, it has got great potential. Just imagine 15 years from now, there is this farmer and his cows are there. Each one of them are radio tagged. And uh, uh, the farmer gets to know how the, what is the health of the cow, when it's ready to you know, get milk and so on and so forth, or what should to, needs to be done. The cow needs some attention or not. Imagine a simple thing today where, uh, you know, the elephants, and today we talk about, you know, the, the man and the wild, uh, uh, you know, friction which keeps on happening in the jungles uh, and in the border cities. So the biggest problem over there is all elephants are radio tagged. Imagine tomorrow if an SMS comes to each and every person in that village whenever an elephant crosses the border. That's what Internet of Things would actually be when we look at it from a social and uh, an application perspective. All right, that's a good note to close this discussion on. Nishant Batra, Sachin Bhatia, Rikin Gandhi, and Shrikant Sinha. Thank you very much for being part of this discussion.